that we shall honor you as a people by all we do. Your name be glorified. Bless this institution, O God, the leadership and the leadership of the state. That together we shall work to bless this nation as a people. And your name will be glorified. In Jesus' most wonderful name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Professor Ndube Zemba, please, is representing His Excellency, the Governor of Enugu State. While the Senator representing Enugu West, Senator Engineer Ositangu, is representing the Senate President. Also mention the principal officers of the university, that's team of management, who are here. The Deputy Vice Chancellor is Professor Chike Moha. Professor Chike Moha, please, you are welcome. The Registrar of the University is Mr. Ambrose Ugu Bosa, Dr. August Ike Ojei, and the University, Acting University Librarian, Dr. Jacinta Eze, incidentally an associate professor. Now, I would like to welcome the chairman of this occasion. The chairman of this occasion is Professor Monsaino Ubiora Ike. Please, I want you to put a hand of uh, applause for him. Yes, I am happy you are here, sir. I would like to recognize the former vice chancellors and the former registrars of this university who are here present. Before the commencement of this program, we have gone through the entire list welcoming you on this occasion. Please, wherever you are, you are cordially welcomed and we appreciate your presence. You're welcome. In the same token, the deans and directors of the university, I can see Mr. Felix, Nam Dr. Felix Namani, our own product, and um, Commissioner, the Enugu State Executive Council, and members of the editorial. You're welcome. He is of the Political Science Department, Enugu State University of Science and Technology. The Chairman, Enugu State Traditional Council of Rulers, uh, His Royal Highness Lawrence Agubozo. He's here in full. Please, sir, you're welcome. Sure. Professor I. I. O. Kafo is the acting provost. And we also welcome the former provost of College of Medicine, Professor Ezugu. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we have our deans, directors, heads of departments here present. We have, like I have mentioned, our director of academic planning, Former pro chancellors who are here, 
if any. But let me just run through quickly the list, the list of our former chief executive, Professor Ezu. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we have our deans, directors, heads of departments here present. We have, like I've mentioned, our director of academic planning. Former pro chancellors who are here, if any. But let me just run through quickly the list, the list of our former chief executives of the university. I have here. Professor Sam Chu is yet to arrive. Professor Onyeji is yet to arrive. Professor I.J. Chidobe, please, I cited you. Can you stand for now? Of course. <laughs> Professor Chidobe is also here. <laughs> Professor Luke Oanike. The man I welcomed in a very special way, not because I served him, but because he was here quarter to nine on the dot. And please, I'd like us to give him a round of applause. Also, we have Professor Mark Adiku is not here. Professor Charles Yukese. It's not also around. And uh, Professor Sam God is I think I have called him. Please, thank you very much. We also have on the list of our former registrars, Professor F.C. Eze. Yes, Excellency, may I inform you that we have the presence 
having established the protocol of today's event, Your Excellency, the Senate President, Federal Republic of Nigeria, Distinguished Senator Goswell Abadi, the Okoku Transformer, heavily represented by a distinguished Senator Ichiya Osita Ngo. May I now invite for this welcome speech by the chairman of today's occasion, Your Excellency. With the kind permission, I invite Professor Osaina Ogura Ike to the podium. Thank you, Prof.
to the paramount, to the pinnacle of that which education must be. Some of us who are religious leaders, the language we use is the light. Let there be light. Light drives away darkness. Light comes when there is ignorance that knowledge can drive away. The university is the place, and Dr. Peter Mba has put a square peg in a square hole to see that the educational transformation which he envisages during his tenure as governor of Enugu State is carried out. And the Honorable Commissioner for Education is indeed well placed to translate this into action. I'm pleased to meet you, the Honorable Commissioner for Education, Dr. Mba, and to thank you also for the good work you are doing for ASUS, for all the universities and tertiary institutions in the Enugu State, and for put, putting yourself under hard work and pressure to orientate our society for a better time. This is not easy, and of course, all of us looking globally, we know that the world in which we live in now is not an easy place. We are challenged by many things at the same time. The climate challenge is there. The poverty issues are growing. The youths who make 80% of Nigeria's population, many of them under 30 years, and we're talking about a population of 240 million, do the mathematics, over 175 million Nigerians are young people who are looking forward to a world and a space where they rightly have a right to belong. So it is a challenge for us who work in the academia, who are teachers in classrooms, who are people who train, who can, can carry out research. It is a challenge for us to do our work and do it well. The biggest problem we have is that those who are placed in positions of leadership, and I'm not talking about the political elite, I'm talking about those who train and teach the political elite, the economic elite, the religious elite, those who are teachers, we are not surely fulfilling our ambitions and our call, our calling. That's why a day like this makes us sober. You could never know everything. You can only know something. And I'm sure that effective legislation for funding of tertiary education institutions in Nigeria, looking at the challenges and ways forward, will be something all of us can take home and work with. It shocks me to hear that universities, which are faculties of management and business schools, go out to hire consultants to write projects for them. What are you there for? You are a professor of management, you are into development, and you go and hire a council to come and do the work which is essential in yours, and thereby denying the institution the funding it requires. I just came back from Plateau because there I'm pro-chance a lot of the University of Plateau State, and I was talking to teachers and those who are responsible. I said, no contrast, God, you do the work. And because we put it there, they are now maximizing the potentials they have in you. When we claim autonomy for universities, we cannot claim intellectual autonomy and man management autonomy without also assuming a certain level, even for federal universities or state universities, of financial autonomy. How do you generate internal revenue? This is a question which we should also ask ourselves because it has to do with dignity. You cannot be a perpetual beggar. You cannot be always cap in hand. And when you look at the Ivy League institutions, whether it's Harvard or Oxford and so on, they generate so much money that they even have to donate to government. A university supports government. And when government founds a university, it founds it not to be a perpetual parasite, but to add to the development potential of giving back. This is not easy discussion, but we know that private universities have shown that it can be done better. They don't receive any TED fund, they don't receive any national endowments, they don't receive any budgetary provisions from government, but many private universities have outdone, and look at the statistics and the criteria of the ranking of universities. Private universities, and they're not even too costly. Hamburg Wingo is just launching the first Ivy League university in Nigeria, they are in River State, and one will be near $40,000 a year, and it's already filled up.
up in terms of those who want. But when you go abroad, you pay more than that. Why should we have such things here? So if we are people who send their children abroad to go and train, and they find money and work very hard to pay for the school fees of their children abroad, these things are also possible here. And we should be thinking seriously about engineering, revamping the economy. I'm not giving the lecture. I'm only challenging us to see that which is before us. Allow me once again to thank the Senate President and his able representative, our own Senator, my own Senator from Enugu West, to please um, get ready to address us. It is always a joy when we look at issues, Enugu State University of Science and Technology, and take note that it had a history. It was ASU Tech, Anambra State University of Science and Technology. It gave birth to the Airborne State University of Science and Technology. And ASU has continued to be the mother of many universities. ASU, take note, when you are a mama, you are no more TT. You are now a mama. In fact, you are a grandmother. Ogodo, eja 
was no registrar cobum babo, also an under tolon tonani, on our wine on air, Ghana or FC as a organatana funding cousinine, Nandina Narol on our university. All broke, Manobo, Manihene. Methodist Church, Macando, Canina, Manda, Ecumenica, Nina, because you of Forge, Ojida. Oduanka, Oja, Gatabak, and Oga, Oja. Along that line, may 
also recognize the following council members. Professor Felix Asawa is here. Professor Chineli Gwenagu is here. And also, Engineer Dr. I. I. Akufwe. Please, a round of applause for them. Now, Mr. Vice Chancellor, may I respectfully and very honorably invite you to come and give your opening remarks. Our Vice Chancellor, very indefatigable personality, transforming everything that we have in that university. So I welcome you and we pray that God will continue to guide you. Thank you, sir. The chairman of uh, today's occasion, Masaino Professor Obi Orike, Your Excellency, the Executive Governor of Enugu State, Barrister Dr. Peter Park, Your Excellency, the Senate President, Senator Oswin Abadio, heavily represented by our own engineer Senator Christian. This is the first time we are meeting him after his uh, victory at the appeal court. So congratulate you and the Senate Senator. <laughs> the Honorable Speaker of the House of Assembly, they will be represented by my good friend and brother. They are most welcome. He's equally the chairman of the uh, Committee on Education. Since he came on board, we've been having very, very good uh, relationship with him and his committee. The Honorable Commissioner for Water Resources, Dr. Naman, you are welcome. Our SDA, Engineer Uguegede Ike, you are most welcome. We thank you again for facilitations. The, the youth former, the, the member, senior member of our immediate pastors, Ambassador Lawrence Agobozo, you are most welcome, the chairman of Khan United States. The representative of um, the yeah, His Excellency, the former Senate President, Chief Ken Naman, is every represented by uh, Retired Major General Ambassador Ugu Yamos Wepo. Um, if I keep on calling names, I know I will fall into a very big trap. Let me most respectfully appreciate the former Vice Chancellors, former Registrars, the management, distinguished audience here, the students of this suit, gentlemen of the press, ladies and gentlemen. I will only crave your indulgence to permit me to recognize my dear wife, who is equally here. Who is uh, an orator, an academic by excellence, man holding canon of spirituality, just two, three minutes. So I now wonder who am I to take more than two minutes to simply say welcome. So we are here today, gathered to celebrate. The celebration is largely a celebration of academic success and fundamental celebration of being alive for a circle of one year. Recall that the prison management came on board last year, between February and uh, April, and the greatest challenge we had was to we kind of reinvent the values and tradition of the founding fathers of Jesus. And the first thing we saw was that the last convocation was held 2016. So we had five year gap, which we considered unacceptable. We now affirm 
that that henceforth we'll be having convocations every other November every year. Some of us might not know that it has great implications for our metric ranking. It's one of the key indicators which they try to use to measure whether a university is alive or dead. When the intellectual community starts seeing that they've never heard about you for five years, it gives them a signal that you are not existing. So we want the whole world to note that this suit is existing, is alive, is well, and has come to stay. That is the fundamental reason why we started by doing things differently. Incidentally, doing things differently coincided with a principle which is being projected by the current governor of the state, which is unusual, not usual. So we started doing this unusually from April last year. We started by thinking as if we are not living in this world, which is normally classified as being mad. When you start doing things against the expectations of the people, you will be classified as being mad. So we started it, started changing the mindset. But of course, we met a workforce that was not motivated. A workforce that they are owing series of salaries. A workforce that desired to perform better but had little opportunities. We expanded the horizon of opportunities. We interface with bodies like Ted Fund, and what we were able to do was to deal with issues that made them to stop issuing some grants for overseas training. And we signed off, and they now allow this suit to be sending people. And I know we have over 20, 25 of academies that are studying all parts of the world. And we only saw a workforce that desired more but got little. We now said payment of salary will now be seen no longer as a privilege, but that it is a right. In this suit today, we have the pay salaries of workers as I'm going to. And I don't think any staff is asking questions again whether we're going to pay them in November. We are going to pay them. such that in the next two years we we'll emphasize 40% academic content and 60% skill acquisition and capacity building. That is why we have engaged and signed MOUs with various international organizations from Canada to US, US for automation, entrepreneurship with Canadian firm, and we are equally localizing what we are doing. We have discussed with Copen Group, we have recruited a vendor now to go and get these people that are making shoes in Naba, textiles in Naba, ceramics in Naba, let them come and engage us. We will get an intermediary because everything we are doing in this group now is on public-private partnership. That is the way to go. We want to bring all of them, assemble them in this suit so that students will acquire necessary skills before graduation because the emphasis now is on, on employability. We have sent our staff now. They've gone for trainings in Abuja on these issues of employability, including the Deputy Vice Chancellor. We want to get our, our students to be the first choice for business community so that as they are, before they will graduate, you will come begging and looking for them in their suits. This is the direction we are going. It's our intention, we have signed a MOU already for greenhouse, greenhouse farming and we are taking off early next year. Once the rate sets up, the greenhouse farming will take off. We want to we want to deal with issues of having to reinvent the issue of uh, palm oil. That's why we started this palm uh, plantation, but we are hindered by a factor which I know that His Excellency, the Executive Governor of Enugu State, will help us to address. Our goal is to plant 5,000 oil palm seedlings so that within the next two and a half years, you will come to issue to buy palm oil. That is our dream. We started the project, planted the ones we planted, and we were blocked by neighboring communities, and we have started discussing on the 
proper way of securing those places, securing our borders, so that we can plant and government will come and buy at the spot. So we are doing much in this suit. We have tried to deal with issues of infrastructural decay. The greatest challenge we are having is on infrastructural deficits. But we are managing, we are trying to remodel and re-roof about four faculties now. We have remodeled and re-roofed the binary session of library. We are going to do much more with the meager resources. But we have some limiting factors. The basic limiting factor in this suit is finance. The total subvention we get amounts to 204 million. But we must face recurrent wage bill monthly of 440 million. For every month, the money must look for 240 million to augment the subvention to pay one more salary. That is the greatest challenge. Trust us and then trust us with resources. And if you come to this with you will know it again. We know what to do. But I believe that His Excellency, every president here, will do something quickly, fast, to rescue us. We are now saying, come over to this and rescue us. The money we are generating and putting into some productive uses are going more into recurrent bills. And we are doing something. We have already done staff biometrics already. The result will be out next week so that we see the composition and where we are having the leakages. But we have tried as much as possible to plug all, all leakages, at least to the point of 90% in the suit. We have done that. And then we are requesting and requesting for interventions, engagements with the Ministry of Education and the government. Let us sit down, sit down, talk, and see how we can take a suit to where we want it to be. But one good news is that we are not deterred by some of these mounting challenges. We cannot continue to sit idly by, bemoaning what we are facing. We are confronting them head on. And we are aware that government can never, and we never at any time, you know, meet up all the wage bills, meet up all the uh, demands from tertiary education. That is why the call by the chairman is very, very pertinent. We must begin to think, uh, think outside the box. That is if we have gotten near the box. If we have not gotten near the box, we must think closer to the box, get to the box, and think outside the box. On the way forward, the critical point is that there must be a way where there are no way. So the present commitment of the administration, present management is to do things correctly without fear of fear. And that's what we started, and that's why we are not going to relent on this. We are going to serve with utmost capacity, trust and integrity in this suit. I will not forget to thank His Excellency for availing himself, especially with the shortest notice. And equally thank the guest lecturer today. When we approached His Excellency, the senior president, we knew he had parallel programs. But even with that, he gave us this thing here, he agreed. And he, in fact, committed that he will call. But something started intervening. The critical point is that he didn't forget all through. He remembered to send the senator. And we thank him and appreciate him. And in sending the senator, he sent the senator that is after our hearts. Engineer Senator Stan. So we are welcome. The base, we are welcome home. We thank you so much, which means the language we are speaking, you understand. Which means what is affecting us, you easily communicate it. Even if nothing happens after this visit, we are expecting that maybe when you get back in the nearest future, there will be at least a structure that we signal that you came here today. We thank you so much and we welcome you. Thank you. Have a good day. On that, ladies and gentlemen, this is the time we have been waiting for. This is the moment we have been waiting for. This is time to invite the guest lecturer, a man of uncommon transformation, a man that distinguishes himself as the executive governor of Akwaiba State. Ladies and gentlemen, this is time to welcome 
the Senate President, Federal Republic of Nigeria. You can join me as I welcome His Excellency, Distinguished Senator Dr. Goswell Akwabi. Thank you, His Excellency. It's not. 
and the overall competitiveness of Nigerian institutions on a global scale. When I was listening to the Vice Chancellor, I actually noticed that ASU is moving in the right direction because he mentioned that they are deliberate in ensuring building the capacity of the lecturers and ensuring that skills and every other thing that is going to make the school to move in direction are being put in place. Thank you, Mr. VC. I am happy with the progress that you reported here when you spoke. However, there are potential solutions and a way forward. Alternative funding sources like public-private partnership, which you also mentioned, student loan programs, which the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria has already introduced, and international collaboration, which he mentioned also, can help address the funding gap. Effective legislation that ensures quality assurance, promotes equity and inclusivity, and encourages research and innovation is also crucial. By advocating for positive changes in legislation and funding, Nigeria can unlock the potential of this higher education system and empower future generations to the quality education they deserve. Rest assured that the third National Assembly, which I belong, which Senator Bottwill and Abio is leading, will certainly look into this. Legislation and funding are essential pillars for the judiciary education in Nigeria. Effective legislation provides a legal framework that ensures quality education, protects the rights of the students and faculty, and establishes governance and accountability structures. Adequate funding supports quality teaching, research, infrastructure development, student services, and faculty recruitment and retention. Together, legislation and funding create an environment that nurtures intellectual development, fosters innovation, and prepares individuals for a successful future. Like I said, two key words we have to pay attention to legislation and funding. The current state of tertiary education in Nigeria is characterized by these challenges and opportunities. However, if we address these challenges and embrace potential solutions, we can overcome some of these obstacles and build a stronger and more competitive higher education system. Let us dwell a little longer on insufficient legislation and funding in Nigeria tertiary education sector. These are significant implications for the quality of education in terms of resources. Limited funding leads to outdated textbooks, a lack of access to research materials, inadequate laboratory equipment, and outdated technology. These hamper students' ability to gain practical skills and exposure to the latest advancement in their fields. Additionally, inadequate funding results in a shortage of qualified faculty, leading to a high faculty-student ratio, increased workload for teachers, and limited mentorship opportunities. Without competitive salaries and benefits, attracting and retaining talented educators and researchers becomes a very big challenge. In fact, this is one other area that we, as a 10th Senate, will have to look to see that we assist the school. Furthermore, limited funding means fewer opportunities for professional development, hindering faculty staff from enhancing their skills and staying up the with pedagogical best practices in terms of curriculum, inadequate legislation and funding can impede a timely revision and updating of curricula to align with industry needs and technological advancements, resulting in a gap between graduate skills and job market requirements. Lastly, insufficient legislation can lead to a lack of comprehensive accreditation process and a weak quality assurance measures, compromising the educational standards and accountability. The aspect of accreditation process is one thing that we have a petition from a school in a Bonny state that the students who are reading medicine have been on one class for three years and they have asked the student to pay three times. They will pay three 
future will not be monitored, it will come as a project. And I can tell you, it is not something I decided here. It is something I discussed extensively with the President of the Senate. Uh, Mr. Vici, give us your short-term and long-term need. We will start from the short-term and see how we are going to do this. you need immediately between now and 2024, we will do something about it. Thank you and God bless you.
60 seconds. We have um, listened to the speech by the Senate President, and we have also seen what's happening in the university. The film that was just shown now showcasing really, real, indeed, good progress of what's happening in that institution.
a tertiary institution, you see that the education sector is a pyramid. At the apex, our institutions of higher education, our tertiary institutions. In the middle,